In this lecture, we will discuss Poland as a case study, right, as uh, Polish politics uh, today, and by today I mean obviously since uh, <clears throat> 1989. So we will look at um, aspects of the political system, uh, politics in Poland, some of the major issues, um, and uh, how uh, you know parties uh, and elections have shaped Poland up to uh, up to today. So this will be an overview, obviously, um, which will try to connect. The materials that you have on canvas with materials uh, that you have in the textbook, right? So uh, you should use all of these together. Okay, uh, so what do we know about Poland as a political system, or before that as a state? As a state, you know that it's a unitary state, and uh, you have a map of Poland there that shows it, shows the major territorial, territorial units and so on. Uh, as a political system, we know that it is a, a semi-presidential system, and that means what? That means that the president is directly elected by the population <coughs> in a two-round, uh, two-ballot vote, and that would correspond with an SND two-ballot system. See my video lecture on the different electoral systems. Right? <coughs> First uh, ballot, all the candidates run together. Uh, the second ballot. <coughs> Um, only the first two go on to the second, so that in the second ballot, uh, which is usually two weeks later, uh, only the top two compete, and whoever wins will have definitely more than uh, uh, will have a majority. Majority means 50% plus one. Um, don't confuse majority with plurality, which simply means the most. Um, so it's a so in the Polish political system, right? We have it's a semi-presidential, which means that both the president and the parliament are directly elected, right? Uh, the same um, and the senate are elected at the same time for four years and the president for five years. Same is elected through PR, proportional representation, while the senate is elected through SMD, FPP. And the rest of the details about elections, you have them uh, in the materials. I'm not going to go over uh, all, all, the, uh, all the details here. Um, so by the entire population, <coughs> obviously from these different districts. Then there is a PM, right, um, who is formed after the, who is uh, nominated, right, after the elections. So in order to nominate a PM, uh, the nomination of the PM will reflect uh, the majority in the Senate. It doesn't depend on the, uh, on the majority in the Senate. So the, of the two houses, the same being more powerful for various uh, reasons, both in terms of how it can pass laws and in terms of its ability to decide uh, who is the prime minister and, and who are the members of the cabinet, and also to remove the prime minister and the cabinet through a vote, through a constructive vote of no confidence, as we have discussed. So uh, uh, you need a majority here in order to um, you need to form a majority here in order to be able to form uh, the government, right? And we also talked about the fact that at the beginning the Polish political system was a strong semi-presidential system, which, mean, which meant that the president had more powers. <coughs> but uh, that that has uh, that has changed, has weakened. Perhaps also as a backlash to that fact. It was a strong semi-presidential system because of uh, Lech Walesa. Uh, <coughs> so, um, and we'll see all these things in action. I mean, that's the point, right? This is how it's set up, and this this is this is what shapes. The functioning of the of the political system. We'll see it in action when we look at elections and so on. So uh, the point is that n nowadays the pr the president uh, does appoint the PM, but appoints the PM to reflect the results of the parliamentary elections, namely the majority of the same. Now uh, here uh, here's the trick that Poland is a multi-party system. A multi-party system means simply that there are several parties, many parties, right? Which means that any majority that will form in the <coughs> lower house or even in, in the upper house will have to be a coalition. Right? So coalition formation is a key issue in multi-party systems, right? Now, uh, Poland is also a sort of an unstable multi-party system, as we'll see, right? Parties change, go in and out, uh, and it's also very fragmented, right? So forming a coalition becomes a major challenge. And this is why, <coughs> this is why, um, uh, and it's typical, right, for, for such situations, that the, the president who nominally, well, formally, he would uh, appoint the PM to reflect, you know, clearly just reflect the majority that was formed here. But if there's no clear majority, 
<coughs> or if it's not clear who will form a majority, the president will have any significant role in perhaps pushing towards a specific majority. Right? He will have a more leeway to choose or to nominate the president. If no majority can be formed here, he can ask. Um, if no majority can be formed here, he can ask randomly, basically, uh, well, randomly, of course, according to his interests, the leader of one of the parties to form a minority government. Minority government means a government, as Poland had at a certain point, uh, 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 it means a government that does not uh, enjoy a majority in the parliament. Okay? So that's, that's a majority, a minority government. So how does it function? Meaning, why do you have to have a majority here in order to form a government? Because any law that is introduced by the executive needs to pass through these chambers, right? If you don't have a majority, you can't pass a law. That's the point, right? So how can a minority government uh, survive? Well, it survives by sort of mutual understandings with the rest of the party. So the, let's say the, the, the majority of the parties don't want to be part of this government, don't want to uh, enter a coalition with uh, whoever forms a minority government, but they kind of agree let, to let them form a minority government. And they will support them on certain issues. So clearly this is a weaker government, but it is accepted by the others uh, in the interest of stability. So that's a minority government. But you see how here, because <coughs> if, uh, if the political system, if the political culture is very fragmented, if there is an unstable multi-party system, the president gets more leeway, even if he doesn't have as much power as before. That's a uh, conundrum with semi-presidential systems, right? We discussed this, that the issue is always, what is the balance of forces between the two major institutions that are directly elected, right? Which is the source of the popular mandate, right? Which is the source of authority in a uh, representative democracy, right? And the balance of forces plays out here. Because this appointment here of the Prime Minister and the Cabinet depends on both. Depends on both the majority here and on um, uh, a president uh, nominating a certain candidate. So you see, it's in between. As I mentioned, France has managed to find um, a way to deal with this, right? And the two cases that can occur here in semi presidential systems are one, cohabitation or unified government. Cohabitation is when Right? When there's a majority here that is different from the party that gave the president, that's cohabitation. In which case, the president needs to respect this majority because, again, governing means passing laws. If you don't have a majority here, you can't pass laws. So the president will appoint someone from the party opposite to him. Right? Now, if the party or the coalition with majority here is the same as the president, then the president kind of has, a, has more power right? because he has a majority in the parliament, so he can appoint whoever he wants, that's unified, he wants, that's unified government. Right? And there is that video lecture from the previous section where I go over all these political systems which you need to know and need to be able to uh, apply continuously because that's what we're doing. We're looking at these different political systems and we're using those concepts to explain them and to describe them. So, semi-presidential system. Okay, so it's a weaker president, has a pres still it's, it's a president that is head of state and has some head of executive functions, while the PM also has head of executive functions. And obviously in cohabitation, PM becomes kind of a more effective head of executive, he's the guy. In the unified government, the president will take some of these head of executive functions back, right? as we'll see. Okay. Um, as for the electoral systems, again, you need to understand how they work, PR, SMB, FTV, and this is why I posted that um, lecture on different electoral systems, because it matters. A PR system uh, will produce usually multi-party systems. So, <coughs> if they would change the electoral system here, uh, then uh, you probably would not have such a fragmented uh, legislature. On the other hand, PR, um, Will, it is more democratic because it reflects the division of votes, the distribution of votes of opinions in the population. Uh, to put it differently, if the US would have a proportional representation, which doesn't mean what in American government it means, some people think it means that the, the number of representatives reflects the, the, the size of the district. That's not what proportional representation means. Again, this, these electoral systems are described in detail in that lecture. And 
uh, you, you uh, should be familiar with that. So, uh, <coughs> if the United States will have a proportional representation system, not, not as in the FDP as it has today, then you would, there would be more than two parties in the United States. So this is how important it is what the electoral system is. Okay. <coughs> um, so, that's, that's, the, that's the broad context. Now let's look at uh, one more thing here, the judiciary, uh, which, uh, uh, again, I posted some materials on Canvas about it, because it's interesting, uh, and we'll do that for each of the case studies, to, to see how, how it is set up. And notice, first of all, that there are several superior courts. There's not just one Supreme Court is in, is in the United States, and that's actually the United States is an exception to the rules. Um, the system of courts um, has, um, all, all courts are based on uh, basically levels of uh, courts, right? And it's regular courts, courts of appeal, and the ultimate court of appeal, right? And that in most countries is called Supreme Court. It's not the same as in the United States. Again, don't confuse, just because it's called the same thing doesn't mean the same thing, right? Um, the Supreme Court in, in Poland is the Supreme Court of Appeals. So all the appeals from the lower courts, whether civil or administrative courts or military courts, they, you know, after they go, go to other courts of appeal, this is the highest level of appeal, right? So, you know, a decision that is, um, can be appealed, right? That's one thing. This Supreme Court does not have judicial review, power of judicial review, meaning of what? Judicial review means the ability to review laws to, to see if they fit the Constitution, right? if they match the Constitution, which in the United States, the highest court, which is called the Supreme Court, has. No, this is just the highest court of appeal. Very powerful and very important. Has also other functions as the materials posted on Canvas uh, show. But there is also a constitutional tribunal. And this constitutional tribunal, it's a different sort of high court. And this one does have judicial review. It's a separate body. It not only has a, a judicial review, it also has the power to regulate. So you see, it's a constitutional tribunal. So it wants to make sure that the system functions. That's the point. It's a different court, right? And um, the, one of the functions is judicial review, but there's another function in which it, it um, makes sure <coughs> it settles disputes between other institutions of the political system. It also checks that the activities of the constitution of the parties fits the constitution, right? So, why? Well, I wonder why. I wonder why. Why would it? Why would you have a court that checks if the parties' activities or ideas do not go against the constitution? Well, think communism, think fascism, think that, right? which, as you see in the constitution that is linked on canvas, uh, are banned. Those parties are banned. So, uh, parties that aggressively want to change the constitutional order are banned. Well, they have had an experience with that, I guess. Um, so, uh, that's the function of the constitutional tribunal, to make sure that the system uh, functions. And again, knowing Polish history, you see how important this is and why they've set this up, right? If you read the constitution, if you look at several of these characteristics of, these, of the political system, <coughs> you will see that they respond, that they are products of the historical experience of what Poland has experienced, right? As a state in this history and so on. So it, it all makes sense. So this is why different political systems look differently, the ideas are different, the parties have different ideas. Um, left and right do not mean the same thing in different countries. And by no means do they mean anything like what they mean in the United States, okay? That's what one gets from studying comparative politics. Understand different political systems means understanding the different societies, understanding the different political cultures. Okay, uh, so how does this work together um, uh, in terms of policy making actually running the country, right? Policy making is <coughs> uh, taking an idea, transforming it into a bill, transforming it into a law, and then applying, implementing it, right? So how is our laws made and how are laws implemented? Well, most of the laws will come from the executive. Mostly uh, from here, especially when it's a cohabitation, right? PM and cabinet, but the president also has a role 
it, most of the laws will be introduced by, from here and the budget laws will be only introduced by the executive. Actually, this is a reflection of the German model. I mentioned that when you know, these countries of Central Eastern Europe set up the new political systems after 1989, you know, I mentioned the four kind of major sources of inspiration, which any political system has. The US, when it was established, the British system was both a positive as and a negative influence, and it shaped what it became. Anyway, so here, one of the influences was the German model, which is again a love-hate sort of relationship. Because in Germany as well, only the executive can introduce uh, budgetary bills. Why? Because this is about something essential for the survival of the state, which is economic stability. Um, the same is more important, uh, powerful than the Senate. The, the bill needs to be passed by both houses. It goes from one to the other. Uh, the Senate can amend, reject, whatever, but the same can bypass. Uh, the same can bypass uh, the, the Senate. The, on, uh, except for certain laws, for example, constitutional amendments, uh, laws that uh, seriously affect the functioning of the state, uh, and so on and so on. Uh, again, you have more documentation on this on the canvas. So there are some important fundamental uh, pieces of legislation in which the Senate has a veto, but uh, there are fewer. Also notice an uh, interesting thing that the Senate, win the weaker house, it always, the question why, have two houses and so on, and that the Senate, notice how the Senate has acquired specific roles, you know, institutions kind of embrace the possibility to acquire new roles because that means new powers. So it acquired these new roles regarding um, a few issues, uh, the EU. So in the relationship between Poland and the EU, the Senate has kind of grabbed a sort of a key roles in, in, in the relationship between Poland and institutions of the European Union, of which it is a, Poland is a part. Um, also, the Senate has acquired, has embraced specific roles regarding the Polish diaspora. And remember that the Polish diaspora, meaning the people of Polish descent who have emigrated, you know, across the history to other countries, but still consider themselves Polish, right? Remember how Polishness is defined, right? That it's basically ethnocultural, interestingly enough, right? Which wasn't in history. But it's basically ethnoculture. So you're Polish no matter where you live, and you might be a citizen of your country, of course. Um, so this Polish diaspora, what, what uh, in Poland is called Polonia, yeah, sort of the nation of Poland, not the state of Poland. Right? Now you understand the difference, uh, which is not bound by the you know, state borders. Well, the Senate is sort of um, assumed responsibilities for uh, relationships and maintaining this, this connection with Polonia, which is the Polish nation around the world. And the Polish diaspora, those people who live in other countries and are both Polish descent and still have a tie to the sort of uh, the nation, um, is very active and very influential, uh, for example, in the US. Furthermore, nowadays, one of the major things that happened in the last 10, 15 years, 10 years, especially after the entry into the EU, has been a renewed emigration from Poland uh, to the West, but we will talk about that. Okay. Um, so, uh, notice also that only the same can remove the PM and the cabinet. In other semi-presidential systems, the president can remove the PM and the cabinet, like in France. But this is a weaker semi-presidential system. Only the same can be removed through a constructive vote of no confidence. The difference being that in a simple vote of no confidence, the same simply votes to remove them. In a constructive vote of uh, no confidence, you can only remove them if there is uh, 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 already set up a majority to appoint another cabinet. And this also has to do with stability and it also reflects the German model. Okay, so uh, now let's look at politics in action. And I posted all those election results. Um, and I'm going to continually make, make reference to them, so you might as well have them handy. <coughs> I'm going to pull them up as well, but also you should be able to read them. And I also attach there a PDF version of the same, because it, the, the, the charts are more visible there on the PDF uh, version. Uh, because this, these election results express all the uh, um, conundrums and the swings in Polish politics since 1989. So what can we say in general? about Polish politics since 1989. 
Uh, one characteristic that immediately jumps up, jumps in, uh, uh, up, uh, out of the, the, these election results is the fragmentation of the Polish uh, political uh, arena. Right, the fact that parties come in and out and continuously change and fragment and reform. So basically, uh, oftentimes you don't have, you don't even have the same parties from one election to the other. There are a few which are more continuous, but even they will go go out after a, a while. And that's that's a, that's a typical, that's one of the major things that immediately um, uh, jump out at, at you. Second thing is that you will see a pendulum like swing, especially in the 90s, but also thereafter, basically in each election there's a different party or coalition that wins uh, the election. In the 90s it was a swing between opposition versus ex-communist, opposition ex-communist, then it changes in the 2000s, it's kind of a swing between center-right parties. Again, right and left means different than in the US, I hope that by the end of this lecture and after reading all the materials you want, you will really understand that. And don't make, please don't make the mistake of uh, applying American criteria or, or ideas about left and right to the Polish reality. It's a different country, it's a different political culture, issues are different, parties are different. Okay, um, so that's one thing, so fragmentation, this pendulum swing, definitely uh, you will see it uh, there. So let's, let's look at some of these election results and that uh, will help us guide our discussion. So the first, um, I'm going to start with the first presidential election. Uh, remember, the president is elected for five years, while the uh, House has a parliament for four years. Uh, the first part, uh, presidential election, as you well know, we discussed this, was won by uh, Lech Walesa. So 1990, immediately after 1989, huge win. So that was pretty straightforward. So he was a very powerful president. He tried to kind of push the limits of the presidency, and that resulted in a bad touch. Notice that already in 1991, when you have the first parliamentary elections that were full elections, in 1989 you had those, remember those elections in which just a part of the parliament was open to the, to the, for free election, the other one was reserved for communists that was part of the tra transition. Well, in 1991 you have the first free full elections, and what results, and this is why I posted the full results in the, the rest of the elections, I, I cut the parties that didn't obtain any seats, because I would just want to focus on those that obtain seats in the parliament. Here, <coughs> in, um, um, in 1991, I left the whole, uh, the whole uh, bunch because it just gives you a sense. Actually, this isn't even the whole thing, because it was more than 100 parties running those elections. Right? In 1991, right? And that, that is a characteristic of the transition in all of these countries after 1989. Remember that one of the challenges of moving of political transition from a one-party system to a multi-party system was creating parties. That's not a simple because parties, what are parties? Are groups of people united by the same policy goals or political ideas, right? But these policy goals form, right? Form in time, form gradually as a result of of changing political culture, of 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 um, ideas, occurrence that form in the population. Now, during communism, the only idea current that could form was I'm working for the government or I'm against it. That was the <laughs> this is why you had the solidarity versus the government. Now, once the communists are removed, then, okay, we remove them, that is solved, right? So that one goal was solved. Now the question is, which way do we go forward, right? Now, the, the developing these alternatives, <coughs> Establishing currents, not just among the elites, right, but among the population, right. This developing this political culture of alternatives, of which alternatives, developing these alternatives. This is a matter of, it takes time. It takes time, and it differs from moment to moment, historical moment to historical moment. This is why parties, not even in two-party systems, like the U.S., for example, the parties are not the same. Actually, it's a, it's a, it's a complete uh, delusion to think that the parties are the same just because they're called the same thing. I mean, the Republican, the Democratic Party today, or 50 years ago, or 100 years ago, or whatever, they stood for different things. 50 years ago, the, Republic, the Democratic Party was a party of racists, to a good degree, right? Because it, uh, it, had, it, it won power, mostly because it had the support of the South, and in the South, everybody was democratic because during the Civil War, Lincoln, the Republican Lincoln, right? was the enemy, sworn enemy of the South, that's how they, he was perceived. So since after the Civil War, nobody in the South voted Republican. Uh, 
Okay, everybody voted Democrat. So by the 1950s, 40s, you know, you, you, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party was an alliance of northern different groups with southern, basically, anti-civil rights groups. No. That's the point. It's just an example. If you want to learn more about this, there are many books on that. But the point is that, uh, you know, parties are formed to win elections. Okay? So they are coalitions that are formed to win elections. And they will always reflect the different currents at the time. And those change. Those change. There is no such eternal realities as part. Parties are functional institutions that are formed in order to win power and govern. Okay? And they will form to win power by winning elections. And they will win elections by convincing the people that the, the ideas that they put together fit, the, fit their interests. Right? And that this is why the platforms will reflect the given political culture, the given issues at the given time. At the given time. This is why parties in different countries are different and reflect different ideas. Because the political culture, the issues, the context, the historical, economic, social uh, context is different. So the issues that will be brought up and will try to attract votes will be different. So um, this is why in 1991 you have this tremendous fragmentation because you have this whole system is still being built up. right? There are no two, three, four major choices, ideological choices. In fact, this will remain a trait of Polish politics uh, throughout, up to today. Your book makes this good point. It has problems, your chapter, but this is a good point. That um, uh, Polish political parties, one of the characteristics that, it, that they have is that they're not well institutionalized. And uh, what does it mean, institutionalized? It, uh, parties... Um, Political parties are successful in two ways. Right? Political parties, in order to be successful, right, the, the group of people who want to follow the same policy goals and want to obtain uh, power in government in order to implement those policy goals in a society. They want the society to go in a specific direction. Now, for that, parties need to do two things. They need to get enough votes from the people to get into power for which they need to have very good organization on the ground, volunteers, clubs, offices, that go around in the neighborhood, all politics is local. The vote is received locally. So you will have to have actual human beings going the streets and uh, calling you and whatever and telling you this is how you should vote and whatever. And that needs to cover the entire country. That is institutionalization. Right? An institution is a set of people that follow the same goals day after day after day, uh, and pursue actions towards those goals, right, in a unified fashion, right, that's an institution, right, and parties are, remain, parties exist when they institutionalize, when they institutionalize well, when you have these machines, right, made of people that perform services following these functions or goals of the party day after day after day. That's what, that's what makes, that ex make, uh, makes a party exist. That's because two people have an idea, that's not a party. Right? But the problem is that in Poland, not even today, are parties well institutionalized. Meaning that you go to every village and you will see the local party organization. Why is this the case? Why are parties in Poland weakly institutionalized? What part of it is, you just heard it, the word. The word party, because the memory of the Communist Party, the living memory of the Communist Party, which had organizations everywhere and dominated every aspect of your life and wanted to infiltrate everything, made them recoil completely from the idea of party after 1990. So that's also common for other countries. So, you see, as we're going through these case studies, we're talking about commonalities as much as differences between these different, these different uh, uh, countries. And in your case study that you will write uh, by the end of the quarter, you will have to reflect that you understand both what is common, both what is different. You will focus on one case study, but you will have to understand, uh, to show that you understand the commonalities and the differences between these uh, case studies, between these countries. Um, <coughs> commonalities for Central Eastern Europe and differences for the given case study. So one of the commonalities is this recoiling, re rejection of even the idea of party, or the idea of this oppressive, top-down, you know, infiltrating everything, 
you know, uh, this is why the names will be different. Solidarity. That's not the name of a party. It's a right. It's the name of a group, or or whatever else. You know, Congress or whatever. Just don't call yourself party. Uh, about Trump. And um, so they are weakly institutionalized. Which means that Polish political parties have a tendency of being parties of personalities, of elites. Meaning that they are grouped around certain figures and people vote for a party because of those figures. Or even if they have a set of ideas and people vote for the party because of those sets of ideas, it's not based on this enduring system of institutions that actually gives permanence to parties. If you have such a ground organization, this is what, even if you lose, lose an election, you can win it back. But if you don't have this and you only rely on convincing the people through ads on TV, you know, by some elites, some just the leaders of the party, if they are thrown out, nothing remains. Right? It's this ground organization that makes the parties continue in time. Okay? So, Polish parties don't really have that, not even today. They're not solidly institutional. But anyway, parties need to win here, and they also need to govern, which means that they need to be able to function together, to form majorities, control both houses, and control the presidency, and to make sure that these institutions work together. Right? This is why parties exist. Parties exist to collect the vote from here, to be present in the electorate, and that's called party in the electorate. And also to make sure that they put the, all the institutions of the political system in the service of their goals. And that's party in government. That's this is party in government, party in the election. Both things are necessary for a party to be successful. Because unless you win the election, you're not in the government. Unless you are able to act in a coordinated fashion in government, unifying the action of these different institutions of the political system, you fail in, again, your goal, which is to shape policy according to your ideas. Okay, well, Polish parties have not really been able to perform some of these functions. Okay, so 1991, back here, uh, here's what happens. Solidarity has fallen apart, has fragmented because of that, the effect of what we just mentioned, that it's... Um, that political culture has not been coalesced into several, into a few major uh, idea directions, ideological directions. <coughs> so what you have is uh, many uh, parties entering the government. Uh, none of them obtaining, uh, forget about majority, because in multi-party systems obtaining majority is very rare. That one party obtains the majority. But not even a significant proportion. N notice that most parties are under under 15 percent, definitely under 20 percent. So, <laughs> how do you form a government, right? And actually, they could not form a, a majority government. So, what you had actually was um, a few smaller parties, well, a few of these parties: Center Civic Alliance, Catholic Election Action, and I think it was. Um, I think it was a Peasants Agreement, uh, forming a minority government that I just told you about, and I also put these in uh, weaker yellow, right? Because these two other parties agreed to, to uh, mutually back this government, okay? So it was a minority government because that's count. 6% plus 18% plus 17%, that's about 41%. They don't have a majority, so it's a minority government, right? But with the mutual support of these, they could pass certain laws. But you, you understand that minority governments have vulnerabil vulnerabilities and they do not last uh, long. Indeed, this, um, the irony of the situation, however, was that if these parties would have been able to work together and look at the other parties down the line, 4%, 3%, and so on, so on if they could have formed a majority. But this is a skill that is acquired. Uh, the, the ability to work in multi-party system, in representative democracy. And again, this was part of the political transition. You need to learn these things. So, uh, <coughs> they form a minority government, and remember, they also uh, are the actors that will implement the famous shock therapy in the economy, which was very effective, but also very painful. Now, you understand, almost every government that implemented shock therapy, wherever it was implemented, remember some did not, 
some countries did not. Uh, well, that government failed. I mean, it was kicked out because these, these are such brutal cuts in subsidies, in, in, in immediate privatization. The social effects are so radical, so immediate, so powerful. Uh, in unemployment, huge uh, inflation, costs uh, rise immediately. People have hurt, right? This is why it's called shock therapy. It's like a shock, right? Therapy, which is implementing the idea that it's going to hurt now, long term it's going to be good. Arguably it worked. Long term. But short term, politics is short term. People don't like to hurt economically. Think, think of the recent economic crisis and all the reactions that came out of that Tea Party and Occupy movement and so on. Okay, which means that you had an election. Uh, uh, in early elections in 1993, because they were kicked out, and the government fell apart. Okay, so two years later, new elections for the parliament, uh, which should have been held in 1995-1993. In this election, it's when the reform communists come to power, and that's the SLD, the Democratic Left Alliance, which had fared well in 91 already, relatively 30 percent, but now they win <coughs> and form a coalition with the Polish. Peasants Party or Polish People's Party, Polish Peasant Peasant. Who, who is this? Now, this was one of those fake parties that existed during communism, you know, one of those smaller satellite parties that only were formally existing. But towards the end of communism, they became, they used the fact that they had an institutional structure, right? Because that's key, right? And again, institutionalization. Well, which parties had institutional structure, meaning cells and organizations and cadre and people who are hired and offices and spread all over the country. I mean, that costs money and you have to rent and you have to work together. Creating institutions doesn't just happen overnight. It's a very arduous business. Well, the two parties that had this was the, were the Communist Party and some of these shadow parties, right? Which existed formally, but guess what? Immediately in 1989, one of them, the Polish Peasants Party, actually became a true, true party, it broke with the Communists, and since then, it has remained one of the important parties in Polish politics, and actually it's a center-right party, on the model of traditional Christian Democratic Party. I'm going to post a, uh, a video with, uh, as a resource for you, uh, discussing uh, political ideologies, not ideologies, but political ideologies, uh, the, the traditional political ideologies, families, in, especially in Europe, right? Because they're not the same as in the US, so want, I want you to have that as a reference. So what does conservative liberal, it doesn't mean what in American parlance they mean at all. Okay? Christian Democratic, what is, what is Christian Democrats? Who are they? They're social Democrats, what does it mean? So I'm going to pose them. Anyway, so the Polish People's Party is a sort of a Christian Democratic center-right. And Christian Democratic simply means that uh, they are based on these values of, uh, they have some of these Christian humanistic uh, values, but you know, family and so on and so on, center-right. Uh, but more modern, right? They are not about wild privatization, free market, and whatever. That's not what Christian Democrats. They're more careful about protecting the family and the individual and the, and the person and so on. Well, anyway, I'm going to post that document so that you have that reference. So anyway, <laughs> so the, the the sort of this new reform communist social democratic party, right? We form a coalition with these for many reasons. They needed the numbers, perhaps, although they had very good numbers. Uh, remember, the same has 460 seats, <coughs> and the, uh, the Senate has uh, uh, 100. Uh, they had the numbers, uh, they had 300. Right? Uh, and um, they, uh, um, so they form a government, uh, and it's interesting because um, the it's a central left party with a central right party, right? And so why did the social democrats, reform communists, enter into this alliance? They need the numbers, but also entering into the alliance with this central right party also gives them credibility, right? Because at this point, what is the fear? Oh, the communists are bad. But these were reform communists, meaning they were social democrats, and actually behaved like it. And, um, uh, you know, successful reform, so to speak. Um, but ally in allying themselves with the center right party was sort of a, uh, you know, proof that we are the good guys now. Anyway, uh, that's what happens in 93, 95. Uh, remember, at this point, Lech Walesa is still president. So here's a solidarity guy, 
and now he has a government from the opposite, from the here's a co uh, cohabitation, right? The president is from one party, solidarity, opposition. These are the reform communists with the peasants' people party. So they had to learn how to cohabitate. It wasn't easy. It was conflict, conflictual. In the next, and this is when Valesa pushes, pushes, pushes the boundaries of what the president can do. He was very aggressive in this. You know, was an anti-communist fighter as he was. Well, the backlash comes two years later with the next presidential elections when Valesa loses. The president has a maximum of two mandates of five years. Well, he could have, he was running for the second mandate, but he loses fairly narrowly, right? Fairly, it's not a big loss. And obviously his rhetoric was anti-communist because he's who's this guy who wins is Kwasniewski, who is a social democrat, actually one of these reform communists. I mean, you can imagine the rhetoric during the, the, that election. The communists are back and whatever, whatever. Now, Kwasniewski, in order to be able to win, right, he had to behave as the opposite of the danger of communists being back. And he was like, no, no, no. And he said, I'm going to be a constitutional president, or I'm going to cross my boundaries. You see here the, how the semi-presidential model moves from a strong semi-presidential to a weak one through the, through, immediate, through the immediate context, political context, that Kwasniewski had to prove himself as the good guy. And actually, when he came to power, he would govern in a very moderate way. Uh, because he was trying to both to prove that he's a Democrat and you know, and acts by the law, and it's not communist, right? And also to um, um, kind of prove to, to, to run as the opposite model of what Valesa was. Valesa, Lech Valesa was a very powerful, impulsive, you know, present president. He was, Kwasniewski, kind of a more moderate, and so on. Again, concrete politics shapes, shapes how it works. Now, uh, meanwhile, so at this point, uh, Kwasniewski wins. So the president is from the same party as the, as the government is now. You have unified government. And in 1997, you have the next elections for, for uh, the parliament. And again, the pendulum. Look, so look what goes up. Swings back. The reform communists are kicked back. Why are they kicked out? Right? Corruption. Uh, allegations and other problems typical for transition, but also the fact that they actually continued the reform communists, the shock transition, the, the economic reforms, privatization, and people were hurting. And people were hurting. And economy, you know, economy is is the basis. If that doesn't work, every other idea is thrown out the window. That's the thing. People want to live. People want to be able to provide. If that hurts, then forget all, all else. That's the that's the bread and butter, actually, literally and figuratively, of politics. Um, so who gets back? So in the electoral action, you see, you can guess what this is, right? It's a, uh, it's a coalition. It's a coalition of those smaller fragmented parties who realize, wait a minute, if we fragment, we can't win elections. They, you see, a skill has been learned. A skill for democratic policies, politics has been learned. <clears throat> Just like today in the US, smaller parties know that they have zero chance of, uh, of winning elections, so well, if you want to join politics in the US, you will join one of the two parties, not because you agree with them necessarily, and in fact they themselves are coalitions of various ideas, very different ideas, but because you know that there's no other chance, because it's SMD, FPP, the electoral system, right? This is also a skill, right? A skill to understand that you need to get enough votes in the population that you need to act uh, together, if you, even if you don't agree, that's the point. It's a skill to learn that parties are not parties, are not groups, solid groups. That parties are coalitions of people who actually don't agree on many things. But only by managing to work together do they, are they able to get into government and then to shape policy, which is also a matter of compromise. That is a skill. That is a skill that most people don't have. You know, this is why, you know, students who are lucky to study political science learn these things because in common day we imagine that these are some unified, uniform blocks that act towards very pure ideas. That's not. Politics is the art of the compromise. It's the art of compromise. It's one of the definitions. Anyway, uh, so uh, they enter into a government with the Freedom Union. Freedom Union was, which was a sort of a, um, economically neoliberal, economical, which means, again, check my <coughs> lecture on the political ideologies. Liberal means free market. That's what liberal means. Okay. Classical liberalism is free market, individual enterprise, 
Neoliberal means that, free market, laissez-faire, economics, and so on. That was freedom union. Reforms, right? Privatization, sell everything, liberalize prices, whatever. At freedom union, so in reality, electoral action, more center-right, right? right? More moderate, more benefits for the people, and so on. But then that's, that's who forms the government. Uh, you see, pendulum goes to the right. 97. In 2000, you have presidential elections. Huge thing, Kwasniewski is re-elected, which tells you, which tells you how well he played his role of a moderate, non-communist uh, president, right? A social democrat who plays by the rules, is very democratic. You see how well he played this. Notice that in between 97 and 2000, what you have, you have a case of cohabitation. Because Kwasniewski is from the social democrats, central left, and the government is solidarity, action, freedom, union, center right. So, Again, yeah, cohabitation. And he, he played the game well. Kind of step back, let the Prime Minister be the Prime Minister. 2001, you have parliamentary elections, remember 5 4, 5 4. Um, and who wins? Again, the swing. Again, the swing. It's the Social Democrats who come back with, again, the Polish Peasants Party. But notice that the Solidarity Electoral Action and the Freedom Union are destroyed, they don't even get into the parliament. Why don't they get into the parliament? Because there is a threshold. PR, proportional representation systems, most of them have thresholds, right? You need to obtain a minimum of percentage of votes in order to get into the parliament. Uh, and in Poland, the, the, the threshold is 5% for parties and 7% uh, percent for coalitions, okay? So, uh, Freedom Union uh, and uh, Solidarity Electoral Action these were actually coalitions of parties. It's, it's a coalition of several other parties. This is why either, uh, um, even if they obtained 5.6, they actually uh, didn't get into parliament the uh, uh, same year. Okay, now with these two different, two new act three new actors here. One is the Law and Justice, which remains up to today, which is a center-right party uh, of what kind? Like all the parties actually in Poland, most of them, but definitely all the center-right parties are fit to the Polish uh, uh, political culture. Meaning, uh, they are, you know, um, certain values are common, okay? Polish people, even today, there's a large, uh, they're very, um, the proportion of people who go to church, the proportion of people who are consider themselves Catholic is very high, very high, uh, comparatively with, definitely with Europe, probably the highest in Europe. Uh, one of the highest, and also worldwide. So the, there is a, the Polish political culture, Polish culture itself is, you know, the, 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 the religious values are very prominent there. Um, and also Polish national uh, patriotism, right? Remember the difference between patriotism and nationalism, but patriotism is also an important value, uh, sometimes veering into nationalism, you know, uh, this experience of communism and so on. So there are certain things that are common that all parties share, you know, you know, because that's what the population is, that's what the population thinks, right? So the, what you have, this is the political culture, and within that political culture there are variations, more or less of this or of, the, of that. Law and Justice Party is a party that combines patriotism, even nationalism, with, with uh, this rhetoric of law and order, or, of order, putting order into things. Now why would the party win with such a title, and why putting order into things? Because the transition, the post-1989 transition has been experienced in many places as a, as a disorder, as a falling apart. Um, because, <clears throat> again, uh, plural, pluralism, you know, this idea that everybody does whatever they want to do, that everybody goes in different directions, uh, that, that there aren't any more these stable frameworks to your life, which were you hated to a good degree, but also gave you, you know, job security, uh, retirement security, whatever, all of this falls apart. People are sort of years. People are sort of in a, you know, in a limbo, right? So there's a sense of disorder. There's also disorder because the rule of law is not as strong, you know, the rule of law, which is a key issue of, of uh, the democratic politics, right? You have to have rule of law. Well, it's inevitable in this, in this turmoil that the rule of law, the functioning of courts, the functioning of police will kind of weaken, right? When the government, the, the system is changed to the to the court or revolution, right? All of these institutions are weak in themselves. 
Plus you have all of this grabbing, like right, corruption, grabbing for privatization, which some people get more than the others, and many, much, much, uh, a larger proportion of the population will lose economically than will win. You know, inevitably you will have growth of inequality. Right? Inequality that it's a reality of American society, for example. But there, it's a new thing. It's a new thing, right? So all of these, you know, it's, are perceived as a disorder, as a falling apart. Plus, you know, there's there's the other thing that has been a part of Polish politics is, which again, a good point that your article makes, makes your chapter makes, uh, among other points that are not as good, actually, in, in the chapter, but this is a good point, is that, or I'm afraid that not good to the fact that the, the author has a kind of an agenda, okay? So you, you will perceive it if you read it carefully. But there are some very good points. Um, and this one is that um, the, dealing with the Communist part, part, past is still an issue in Polish politics. And it means many things. It means putting those guilty to trial. It means dealing with the secret police. I mean, understand, you made a revolution. The people have not changed. Meaning, the same people who existed there before still exist. You know, those who were employees of the state or secret police, they didn't emigrate. Right? This revolution didn't kill those people. Okay? So how do you deal with those who have been part of the oppressor class? They haven't left. Okay? How do you deal with those who have oh, been oppressing you, have been you know, taking your rights and so on? What do you do with them? What do you do with them without breaking the society apart? Right? It's all these things. Uh, plus, the legacy of you know, the Communist Party, you know, the, the wealth of the Communist Party, you know, how did it transition into the, into the new system? Right? Where is it? You know, where, where is all that money? And so on and so on. So you have all these layers of dealing with the past. Of, remember that in 50 years of communism, Everything was falsified, including history, history books. Like things have not been talked about, like famously Katyn, the Katyn massacre, massacre in the World War II, where the Soviet Union killed what was it, uh, twenty thousand or six thousand Polish army. The top of the Polish army was massacred in one gesture in the forest. Okay, Katyn. Okay, that was not talked about for fifty years, but everybody knew it, right? So all of these have to be have to be worked out. Law and justice brand on, on, on such a platform. And I'm going to continue in the second part.